program. So, all right, good evening and welcome to tonight's program, What's New in the Penobscot River with fish biologist, Danielle Frechette, who is here to give us an overview of the diadromous fish restoration in the Penobscot River as a result of the Penobscot River Restoration Project. I'm Brenda Harrington, program librarian at the Belfast Free Library. Thank you all for joining us. We're pleased to continue to co-sponsor these programs with the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition and glad we've been able to do so remotely. I wanna remind you all to please keep your mics muted and it's up to you if you keep your cameras off or on. Just a reminder, it's being recorded um, and we will have a Q&A after the program so please type your questions into the chat box and I will read them to Danielle when the pre presentation is over. Um, next, I will turn the mic over to Tom King, board member from the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition for some updates and to introduce tonight's speaker. So take it away, Tom. Thank you, Brenda. And um, great. Welcome everybody to our program. And like Brenda said, what's new in the Penobscot River? Danielle French is gonna be our speaker tonight. But before we go any farther, I just wanna make people aware of the fact that next Thursday night, we're gonna have a special program on the brown-tailed moth, which um, has appeared here in the Belfast area. And uh, I think it will be uh, uh, you know, worth uh, visiting us on this program. Keep checking our website, if you will, for any updates we have and um, what else is going on with BBWC. Um, as you know, Brenda mentioned that um, Danielle is going to be talking about diadromous fish in the Penobscot River, and it's it's really an exciting time for the Penobscot River, realizing that we've removed two dams, put a new fish ladder in, and moved for the VZ and Great Works. So. This is huge and it's opened up quite, quite a, you know, part of the river and it's a, brought in a tremendous amount of diadromous fish. Danielle is a um, resource scientist uh, number two. She um, is really dealing with, um, you know, the, the main rivers program, not only in the Penobscot, but all the rivers and has an, a special um, no interest in uh, how they, how the rivers and the salmon will adapt to climate change. Uh, she comes here from working with coho salmon out on the West Coast, and she spent some time uh, in Quebec working with Atlantic salmon. Uh, she is a Northern New England girl. Uh, she's not quite a Mainer, but uh, she's close. She's from New Hampshire. Uh, I think she was born here, but then left very quickly after that. So with that, Danielle, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, where's my, which direction am I pushing my button here? There we go, okay. Um, so because we're talking about the Penobscot River, I'd like to stop for a moment before we head on and acknowledge the chiefs, elders, and members of the Penobscot Indian Nation for whom this river has been a form of, of sustenance for since time immemorial. And the Penobscot River is also home to 12 species of sea run or diadromous fish. So these are fish that need both the marine environment and fresh water to complete their life cycles. From a historical perspective, the Penobscot Indian Nation um, used these fish for sustenance again since time immemorial. And then with, the, with colonization, these sea run fish became an important source of food for the European settlers, issuing in a strong commercial fishing industry and also issuing, ushering in an era of dam building. In the 1920s, partial dams were built in Old Town and Orno. And in 1934, the first dam to cross to, to completely span the main stem was built at Eddington Ben. Um, and there were no fish passage provisions at first. Our 12 species of diagemous fish were effectively brought, blocked from their upstream passage, um, really in effect that this fish passage was in, ineffective for the next 150 years. And what fish passage there was focused on Atlantic salmon. And as Tom mentioned, that all changed with two, two key things, the Penobscot River Restoration Project 
that was initiated in 2004 with the signing of the Lower Penobscot Settlement River, River Settlement Accord, um, and also the State of Maine Penobscot River Diagemus Fish Species Restoration Plan. It's a mouthful. Um, but the, the Penobscot River Restoration Project was really a, a collaborative effort to rebalance fisheries restoration and hydropower. So if you look at the map um, on the right here, you can see how improvements at some of the dams like Medway Dam, West Enfield, Milford, Stillwater, Orno, and the Ellsworth Project on the Union River increased energy generating capacity, allowing for the complete removal of the VZ and old um, Great Works dams, excuse me, and then the installation of a, a brand new state-of-the-art fish lift at Milford uh, to help improve fish passage. And so what that looked like, here's the photographs of the Great Works and VZ dam removals in 2012 and 2013. And then the Milford fish lift was completed in 2014. And then that Howland bypass was completed in 2016. And this image gives you an idea of what we were looking at both before and after for access to habitat for diagemous fish, for sea run fish. So one thing I do wanna make note of that, that you don't see on this map is the West Branch of the Penobscot River, which still lacks fish passage entirely. So there is a jutting off right about here um, is the, the West Branch of the Penobscot River. So what we see now is um, where we had kind of very diminished use of upstream habitat for salmon and eels, um, very little, if any, passage for some of our smaller, less, uh, less adept swimmers like shad, alewife, and blueback herring. We now have uh, access for nearly a thousand miles. I am going to focus a bit on Milford Dam because this is now the first dam that fish see when they come in from the ocean. And this is what used to be there for fish passage. This is the Daniel Fishway that was all right for Atlantic salmon, but really was probably pretty ineffective for species like shad, which aren't as capable of ascending this type of a, a challenging fish ladder. So in this image, you can see the new fish lift. So are you able to see my cursor here? So here's the, this is the entrance to the fish lift. It's about 300 feet long up to the upstream end. The fish enter here. And it's essentially a, a giant fish elevator. Wait for it. Here they come. So the fish get lifted and released into an upper flume, which you can see here. This is when the, the flume was dewatered for some maintenance. And you can see my colleague Jason for scale there. Fish then pass by a viewing window, which is where we're able to count the fish and identify them to species. Um, and I really love this video because it gives you a sense of how well the fish lift can perform for not just salmon, but for many of our species of, of sea run fish. So in this video, in this one frame, you'll see um, we've got a couple of sea lamprey and Atlantic salmon, uh, shad, and both blueback and um, back herring and, and alewives. So once the fish pass through the viewing window, they're uh, then lifted by this into a, they can, excuse me, they can either um, be passed up into the head pond and head on their way, or they can be transferred into through a sorting hopper and into a pool where we can collect biological data. So length, uh, fish, fish length, fish sex, we can collect scale samples to determine the age of the fish. Um, so, 
These are the data for both the Milford and Orno fishways for 2020. Um, the foremost commonly, the foremost um, commonly caught species are Atlantic salmon. We had 1,440 uh, enter the Penobscot River this year. We had uh, over 11,000 American shad. We had over 2 million river herring, so that's bluebacks and alewives combined. And we had over 6,600 sea lamprey, as well as a whole host of other species. So that's just this year. What, what are we looking at over the last 10 years? Um, here we have American shad, striped bass, sea lamprey, and short-nosed sturgeon. And I have highlighted the, eight, the years of the Penobscot River Restoration Project in this blue box. So we had um, the two dam removals, the Milford fish lift installed, and then in 2016, that Howland bypass completed. So you can see that prior to the installation of the fish lift, we really weren't seeing any shad. Um, and then we also see, we, so we see a, quite a large increase in the number of shad. Um, we see an increase in the number of sea lamprey. Short-nosed sturgeon are still pretty rare getting up this high. Um, and then striped bass, I'm not sure what, what's going on with them. Um, I've taken the river herring, however, and put them on their own graph because if I put them on with the other species, they just wash everything out. Um, and this one, I, this is, is uh, a really, point an example of how well removing the two dams, installing better fish passage, fish passage is really designed to work for these specific species, um, along with some strategic stocking of the fish into some, some key breeding areas, has really led to a very dramatic increase in the number of river herring using the Penobscot River. So in 2010, we're just 222 river herring, and in the last three years, we've had over 2 million fish uh, each year. So I'm going to spend the next part of the talk talking about Atlantic salmon because that's what I spend most of my time working on. Um, and before moving on, I just wanted to do a quick review of the Atlantic salmon life cycle. So our mature adults are the ones that are coming back to the river in the summer. They will spawn in the fall and lay their eggs in the gravel. Their young will emerge as fry in the spring, and they'll remain in the river one to three years at, at the life stage that we call par right here. And then in the spring, when they're ready to go to sea, they'll undergo a transformation um, into a stage that we call smolt, and that's the stage that's capable of, of heading out to sea and dealing with the challenges of, of salt water. And they'll spend from one to three years at sea um, with most of our main salmon coming back after two years in the ocean. So this is what we're looking at for Penobscot River Atlantic salmon returns over the last 50 years. Now this is actually VZ, counts from VZ Dam um, and Milford Dam combined. So up to up until the removal of VZ Dam, those, uh, the counts are from, from VZ. And then as we move on um, with the installation of the fish lift at Milford, the counts transition over to Milford. Um, there are a few things I'd like to highlight on this slide. Again, the, the years of the Penobscot River Restoration Project are highlighted in the box. In 2009, the Penobscot River salmon were added to the Federal Endangered Species List um, in, a, in an expanded list, an expansion of the, the 2000 listing of some of the other populations in Maine. I'd also like to draw your attention to um, the bars that I've coded both blue and orange. So the Blue bars are smolt stocked origin. So these are, are fish that are reared in the hatchery and stocked out at that smolt stage when they're ready to go to the ocean. And then orange bars are the fish that are what we call natural origin. So these are either salmon that were, their parents spawned in the wild and they were born in the wild, or they are hatchery produced fish that were released into the river either at the egg par stage. The reason that I have separated them out is that one of the key things that we need to do to take Atlantic salmon from new threatened status is to have 500 naturally reared returning adults coming back to the Penobscot River, as well as to some of the other rivers of Maine. But the Penobscot itself, we, we, want, we need to see 500 naturally reared returns. So again, fish that their parents spawned in the wild or that they were released into the wild at one of those younger life stages where they've got some natural experience, some experience rearing in the river, growing up in the river itself before going to sea. 
And you can see that with a couple, with only some exceptions of um, the late 80s and early 90s, we're still really the interesting thing we're seeing though is this uptick in the last couple of years. Um, this is something that we're not just seeing a slight increase here in Maine, it is being seen in Atlantic Canada as well, which hopefully means that something might be getting better in the ocean, allowing fish to return at a higher rate, but that's still something that um, is an area of active research. So what are we doing for salmon now? Um, one of the key things is the conservation hatchery program run by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, returning adults are collected at Milford Dam and they're taken to Craig, Craig Brook National Fish Hatchery where they're spawned. Um, and they use a um, genetic management techniques to try to maintain the, the genetic diversity of the salmon in the program so that these are, these are true main, genetically main salmon. These are not um, the aquaculture raised salmon that you might see in your grocery store. These are true main salmon. Um, and the, the conservation hatchery program has done a good job of preventing Atlantic salmon from going extinct in Maine, um, and also maintaining the genetic diversity that existed back in, in 2000 and 2009 when the, the populations were listed under the Endangered Species Act. So as I mentioned, we release the salmon at different life stages. So one of the really neat things that, um, that we do here in Maine is to plant hatchery produced salmon at the egg stage using a hydraulic egg planter. So other places in the country, um, other areas of the world, they put eggs in boxes and bury them in the river. But um, Paul Chrisman at DMR learned a technique from out west that he's applied really well here and has spread through Maine where we basically use water to force the eggs down into the gravel. So they grow, they, they are in an egg pocket in the gravel, just like they would be if their mother buried them in the gravel herself. Um, this is a really fast productive means of getting eggs into the gravel. The only problem with it is that it happens in the winter when it's cold and it's hard to access the river. So it's, we'd love to be able to do it more places, but it's just, it's hard to do. Um, so we're kind of limited in the number of salmon we can get into the gravel at that early stage to have the maximum amount of natural uh, rearing exposure. The other two ways that they're released in what we call a natural origin release strategy are they're released at the fry stage in early spring or the or as par, excuse me, as par in the fall. So again, the reason we are referring to these fish as natural origin is because they have some, they have some exposure to the river itself before they go to sea. We also have our hatchery origin release strategy. Um, and these, this is where fish are released at the smolt stage. They're kept um, at Green Lake National Fish Hatchery until they reach the smolt stage and then they're released into the river. The target for the Penobscot is 650,000 and they're currently released downstream of Milford Dam. So to give you a sense of what kind of numbers we're talking about, these are the numbers from 2019. Uh, so we had 93,000 par, 555,000 smolts, almost 5,000 eggs planted using those hydraulic egg planters, uh, 630,000 fry for a total of almost 2 million salmon being put out into the Penobscot River in 2019. So if we're seeing you know, better fish, much better fish passage on the Penobscot River, um, and we have this really comprehensive hatchery program, why are we still not seeing salmon rebounding quite as quickly as some of our other species? And that's because some of the best salmon habitat is still above multiple dams. For example, in the Piscataquist River, they still have their three dams that the fish need to pass. Um, and then there are two more dams going up into the east branch of the Penobscot River. Uh, the marine survival has been quite low. Only one tenth of a percent of the smolts that are stocked into the Penobscot uh, have been returning as adults. I haven't seen the, the numbers for this past year. It, it's hopefully going to go up a little bit, but it's still going to be less than a percent. Um, and we really, to see salmon adults replacing themselves, we really need to see somewhere around at least 4% of the, of the fish going out coming back as adults. With that long-term hatchery intervention, 
may be may come with a loss of fitness. So the hatchery fish might not be as good at surviving and reproducing in the wild, which is why we might see better success with those fish that are released younger um, and have some of that natural rearing origin than we see with the smolt stocked fish. And then what we're left with is huge areas of habitat that's either underutilized or unoccupied. So we have a new program that we're actually launching this year um, to try to help fill some of that underutilized and unoccupied habitat and give our fish a little bit more natural rearing exposure. We're calling this program Salmon for Maine's Rivers. And this is a new partnership for salmon recovery. It's a partnership between DMR, Penobscot Indian Nation, NOAA Fisheries, US Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, Downey Salmon Federation, and a new partner to our group, Cook Aquaculture. And what this is, what this program is, is really a way of flipping the hatchery model on its head. Um, it's what we call marine captive rearing, also known as smolt to adult supplementation. And the way this works is that we collect smolts, ideally from the wild. We raise them in near shore marine net pens. So in the ocean, but in a, in a pen. And then once they're mature, we release those adults back into their native river. So in this case, the Penobscot River. And so really what this is, is the reverse of most of our current salmon hatchery operations where we are bringing the adults into the hatchery, spawning them, and then putting their offspring out into the wild. In this case, we're taking smolts, again, ideally from the wild, bringing them into a captive setting, raising them until they're adults and letting them go spawn on their own. Um, our program here in Maine is based on a program up in the Bay of Fundy called Fundy Salmon Recovery. Um, they have a really nice website that has some videos and explanations of how, how they're doing this work. Um, for us, what it's going to look like is in just a few weeks, we'll be taking 6,500 Penobscot smolts from Green Lake National Fish Hatchery and transferring them to a near shore net pen. And then we're going to rely on the experience of cook aquaculture. They're, they're the ones who know how to grow fish well in pens in the ocean. And so they will be growing the fish for us until they reach the mature, until they're mature. And once they're mature, we're going to be releasing them into high quality spawning habitat. Um, so the east branch of the Penobscot River, this is uh, Wasada, the east branch up near the confluence of Wasada Cook in this photo here. Um, we expect the first release of fish to be in 2000, and tw excuse me, in 2022. Uh, those will be fish that we kind of consider uh, the equivalent of a salmon that was returning from the ocean at one year but we are expecting most of the fish will mature after two years in the net pens and they'd be released in 2023. We'll then be monitoring this program success at, at specific checkpoints, so at different life cycles, life stages, and then repeating this program in an adaptive management framework. Um, and ultimately in future years, uh, we plan to be collecting natural origin smolts from the river to put into the net pens. So there are kind of two key ways that we think this approach may help recovery efforts for salmon. And the first is by increasing spawner abundance. If we take 10,000 smolts and allow them to migrate up to West Greenland at that tenth of a, excuse me, hundredth of a percent marine survival, we'd expect 10 adults back. But in the net pens, we're expecting somewhere between 50 and 95% survival, which means 5,000 to 9,500 adults that we can release back into the river. And salmon are really good at finding good places to spawn. They are much better at getting into some of those areas. As I mentioned, when we're egg planting, it requires snowmobiles and ATVs and snowshoes and, and a lot of work to get a bunch of people in there to plant a few eggs, whereas one female can get the same number of eggs out much more effectively. And you have um, both, actually, I think that's in my next slide. I'll go to my next slide. Um, so the other way that we hope that it will help, might help recovery efforts is by increasing fitness or wildness. So those adults that are spawning, those net pen reared adults that are spawning in the river, choose their mates during spawning. So we have sexual selection operating in the wild from the time when the parents are, are, are spawning. 
and then their offspring will face natural selection during the rearing period, the entire rearing period. So they'll have to face predators, they'll have to find their own food, making what might look a little more like one of our domesticated dogs and hopefully look a little bit more like a wolf because it, it has faced all of those pressures in the wild. Um, so we, the, there's also another benefit of this program is that salmon are very good at improving their own habitat. So as the, as the adults are spawning, they're cleaning out the gravel and they can help them take some river habitat that may not look like what it should because of years and years of log drives and other um, habitat alterations and actually make it better for themselves for their future generations as well. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about was actually switching gears to a completely different set of sea run species and a completely different program. So one half of my job is working on the, the Salmon for Maine Rivers program. I'm the lead biologist for that program. The other half of my job is working on a citizen science initiative for sea run fish. This is a joint effort that we launched last year um, between DMR, the Nature Conservancy, and the Down East Salmon Federation. And we've developed uh, two different citizen science um, efforts, one for rainbow smelt that's happening in the spring, and one for tom cod that's happening in the winter. And these projects are being hosted under the Gulf of Maine Research Institute's Ecosystem Investigation Network which is a suite of citizen science projects designed to help us better understand how the Gulf of Maine is changing and adapting with climate change. So uh, we launched a tomcod survey or frostfish survey in December of this past year. Uh, if that's a species you're interested in, look for a training sometime in November or December of this year. But our smelt survey is just kicking off right now. Um, the smelt spawning season is uh, March to early May, west of Penobscot Bay, and April to mid-June, east of Penobscot Bay. And key reason that we need citizen scientists to help us survey for spawning smelt is that there are a lot of streams. There are 297 smelt streams that have been surveyed in the past by DMR, and that's a lot of streams along a huge tidal coastline, a coastline that's 3,478 miles long. And we just don't have enough people on the ground at, to be able to survey these streams at a frequent, enough of these streams at a frequent enough interval to really keep tabs on the population and uh, keep, a, keep a sense of what's going on. So what we really need are more boots on the ground. And so bringing in citizen scientists can really help us get out there and cover more ground every year and really document what's going on with smelt populations um, across the, our entire coastline. Data that we collect, that the citizen scientists collect, will be used to help us identify undocumented runs. And it will also help us prioritize streams for things like population restoration, uh, replacement of culverts, uh, this culvert that you see here is a fantastic example of something that's not good for fish passage. Um, and also uh, uh, prioritize streams for road stream crossing uh, improvements. Um, for example, this is a photograph of a huge smelt egg bed that was taken the year after a road stream crossing was repaired on smelt stream in Perry, Maine. Um, there were smelt and tomcod below, uh, it's an, it was an old, Route one crossing that was falling apart, fish couldn't really get above it. It was documented through these surveys and they went in and removed that, that bad road crossing. And within a year, this is what, what was being seen for smelt spawning. So uh, we know that when we, when we take actions to improve fish passage, things can get, can get better pretty quickly um, if the fish are there. So, Here's a blow up of the Penobscot Bay estuary. And what you can see is that there are a lot of streams, uh, a lot of smelt streams that we're interested in having surveyed um, around, uh, around the estuary itself, as well as um, on some of the islands. So if you are interested in getting involved with the smelt survey, please contact me directly. Um, and if you want more information on this survey or the Tomcod survey, you can go to the Gulf of Maine Research Institute website, um, the Smelt Spawning Project landing page. So 
think that covers everything that I was, hopefully I didn't rush through that too quickly. Um, no, that was great. Um, this is Brenda. Um, there are no questions in the chat right yet, so I invite people to um, enter questions, but I want to mention that the city of Belfast and the, in collaboration with the library and the um, Climate Crisis Committee, we also have a citizen science project that we did with Gulf of Maine Research Center Institute, I mean, last year on um, having people uh, observe high tide and coastal flooding. Um, and so we have six sites around the um, Penobscot Bay or the Belfast Bay where people are invited to take pictures and upload them to the website. It's the same, it's the same area where this one is. I have seen it there before. I didn't make the connection until you just shared that, Danielle. So it's really cool. I invite everybody to look at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute's um, citizen science page pages. Yeah. Thank you for making that connection for me too, Brenda, because I'd seen I'd seen that project on there and now I'm drawing the making yeah. the connection as well. It's great. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So um does anybody have any questions? Okay. I have one here. Um what is the data on white perch status? Oh, that is a good question. Um I don't actually know. That is not in my I'm not in my realm. I would have to ask ask back to some of my colleagues. Apologies. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Give them a couple minutes. Um, Danielle, on the on the pen rearing. Where and when are you imprinting these adults? So the, the hatchery smolts won't have any early imprinting. They'll be going right to the net pens. Um, our strategy is to release them as close to the spawning timing as possible on the high quality spawning habitat that we'd like them to use. We do know from previous work that up to half of them might not stay where we want them to be. And so our numbers, the numbers of fish that we're rearing are meant to reflect. In releasing them, uh, okay, so you're taking from net pen and you're trucking up river? Yes, yes. Um, in, in future years, we are, right now we don't have, we don't have, in future years, we plan to catch smolts right in the East Branch itself that we'll be able to take to the net pen. So those smolts will be imprinted. But with the numbers up, up until this year, this year we had, oh, the hatchery because of COVID took 200, I think it was 250 Penobscots adults. So we had over 1200 salmon in the Penobscot River at spawning time this year. So we're hoping that that numbers of smolts will be higher, but with the numbers of fish spawning in the river, we at, at, in the early years of this program weren't confident that there would be enough smolts to catch to be able to, to get this program started and off the ground. Um, but we're really hopeful that in the future we'll be able to catch a, a good number of smolts to have um, fish that are imprinted, but also that have a, that early life history rearing in the river. And and <clears throat> you're using strictly the East Branch for this right now? We actually, we do, I, I only spoke about the East Branch here, but we do have a second project for the Machias River. So we will have Machias River smolts that are being raised for the Machias River and then Penobscot River smolts being raised for the East Branch project. And is there any hope to open it up the West Branch now that, you know, the the paper mills have um, become dinosaurs and the power isn't needed as much? There, there are discussions. Um, that is one of the things that was discussed through the Penobscot, uh, Penobscot River Shrew team meetings this past year. Um, and I know that Dan McCaw is very interested in, in spearheading some of that. So we'll see, mm -hmm. it, it's being discussed. And, and of course, the, you know, I know you're not, you, you know, on the Kennebec, but you, it's, it, you know, it's in your, in your uh, ball 
park, uh, you know. Uh, the Kennebec Dam removal and for Lockwood and uh, Shalma and uh, it, that is proceeding forward. So at this point, DMR has put out an amendment to the 1993 Kennebec management plan that does discuss removal of those two dams. It's in, I think, I guess, probably the best way to say it is the early phases. The, the public hearing for that was, was just this past Monday. Um, so. Um, okay, Tom, I have some more questions in the chat, so I'm gonna interrupt you. <laughs> so no, one question is, what are the criteria for identifying smelt runs and how many fish constitute a run? I assume he means smelt, not smolt. I don't know. Um. For smelts, um, smelt are spawning at or above, at just above or just below the head of tide, really. They should be spawning just above, but um, they don't always follow that rule. Um, their eggs will die if they spawn below the head of tide. Um, but you're, you wanna be looking for smelt eggs uh, during the day again, at or below the, or at, at or above the head of tide. Um, the adults run at night. Um, the best time to see them is um, around the high tide, the nighttime high tide. And they'll be running into all sorts of sized streams. It could be something that you could hop across up to something quite a bit larger. Um, cobbly, Cobbly substrate is good. Um, and so if I could actually go back and um, a good place to look for them would be say Marsh Stream. Um, trying to think of some of the other stream names, but really any small coastal tidal drainage. Um, an interesting thing about smelt is unlike salmon, they're not necessarily going back to the river where they were born. Um, you could have two or two different streams on the same bay and they could go in one one year and the another another year. Um, so we're not just asking people to look at these 297 surveyed streams. We're also asking people to explore. If you've got a little tidal drainage in your backyard or on your street, we'd love people to check that out because um, one of the things we're really trying to capture is how how they're um, distribution is changing from year to year. Um, a run itself, it could be a few fish in some of the um, more populous streams. It could be tens of thousands of fish. So anywhere from, you could see, you might see, I've had people, our, our, um, our data sheet has anywhere from zero to 10 up to tens of thousands of fish. So it really depends on the stream, um, yeah. All right. Um, what other what other rivers are historic salmon breeding waters, and are there restoration projects on them? Yeah. So um, the Kennebec River was mentioned. Um, the Saco River had salmon runs. Um, the really so salmon used to inhabit a lot of rivers, many rivers. I don't know if it was most rivers, but really. Um, from Long Island Sound all the way up through New England, New Hampshire, Maine, up into Atlantic Canada, all the way through Newfoundland, Labrador, and to Angava, um, Angava Bay. And Maine is really the last place that Atlantic salmon remain in the US. Um, the runs are considered, the rivers are considered extirpated in New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut. Rhode Island, um, we're, we're kind of the last, the last stand for Atlantic salmon in the United States. Um, most of the restoration work is focused around the Kennebec, the Penobscot, and then our seven down east rivers. So the Machias, the East Machias, the Pleasant. Oh, and I'm drawing, why am I drawing a blank right now? The Narraguegas, the, there's a lot of restoration work for, uh, around the Narraguegas River. Um, yep. That's cool. 
Um, so uh, there's another comment and question. Uh, we are seeing salmon returns to the Duck Trap River dwindle. What are the options for returning salmon to the Duck Trap River? Are you familiar where that is in Lincolnville? Yeah. Yeah, I am familiar. And the Duck Trap is, to be honest, I don't really know how to answer that question. That's one that we talk a lot about. Um, one, one thing that's talked about is whether if runs in the Penobscot get strong enough, the fish will find their way around the corner to the duck trap. But to be honest, I, I don't really have a good answer to that one right now. Okay. Well, that was the last question in the chat. If anybody else has another question, um, either put it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask a question. Um, I, I would invite um, Danielle, why don't you mention uh, exactly how people can get involved in your citizen science project? I think that would be, um, uh, you yeah. said something to me earlier about it being a virtual. Um, yeah. Thing. So what we did is we had, um, we hosted a, a Zoom training on earlier this month and that training was recorded. So what you need to do to get involved is send me an email and I will send you uh, the link to watch the training. Um, there's also a link for a, a post training survey. It's a Google form that you fill out that has um, a couple of questions. One of the questions is, did you watch the training? Because we really, need, we really need people to watch the training to be able to do the survey because that's going to train you how to quantify, like uh, determine what substrate type looks like. Is it cobble, gravel, sand? It's going to tell you how to determine what the canopy cover is. Is it 50% canopy cover or 75% canopy cover? Um, it'll talk a lot more about what a smelt stream looks like, what you're looking for, what, how, how and when to go out to do it. Um, so watching that training is, is really the first step. And then filling out the form that, that certifies that you did the training. Um, it also gives you a chance to say where you plan to survey and whether you need some help finding a stream near you, or if you've got, you know, if you've got a stream that you already know about that you want to survey, that's fine too. Um, and then in that email, I'll also provide links to the data sheets, um, links to the GM GMRI website where you can register to submit data. Um, so data is collected, it's on paper data sheets, and then you enter it into a computer hit send and it transmits the data electronically to us um, through their website. Um, yeah, those are really the key steps. Cool. Well, thank you for going over that again. I think it's important. Yeah. Uh, we have lots of citizen scientists in Belfast. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Cause that's actually, you know, the, the Penobscot estuary is where we don't have a lot of coverage. We've got a lot of folks down East and we've got, um, a reasonable number of people in the mid coast, but but really getting folks into those streams around the estuary is going to be uh, really key. So it'd be great to have some of you uh, involved. All right, all right, some of you send her an email. <laughs> all right, any more questions? Uh, just one on the tomcat. Uh, are they returning? That's a good question. Um, we had a. We had a volunteer in our tomcod survey who used to fish for tomcod in the 70s and, and he gave us this really poignant quote where he said he always wondered whether they were still here and now he's got his answer. Um, and at least the streams that he used to fish, he didn't see any in. Um, we did have some, some fish seen in down at some of the streams down east. Um, we actually had a really cool occurrence where some of our volunteers went out to survey at Damerscotta Mills and actually found a dead tomcod frozen to the, the deck by the new fish, the new decking by the fish ladder. Um, and I think what happened was that they spooked a, um, a, ball, a young bald eagle, a juvenile bald eagle, as they walked up and think that the eagle probably dropped that fish. So we know that there are tomcod there, um, but this was, uh, this was the inaugural year of the survey. We only had a handful of volunteers. Um, and so we're looking forward to, to more data in the future, but it's, I don't know, 
but not looking great, I guess. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? Well, I guess not. So um, thank you so much. What, Tom? I just say, thank you, Danielle. Yeah, Very thank you. Job. Great presentation. Enjoyed it. And you 